New for 2023 from CMMG, the compact action descent is now in 9mm. Their descent line took portability to a whole new level and now they've done it again. Available in 6.5 and 10.5 barrel lengths, this compact platform offers the modularity of the AR-15 while being compatible with a wide range of magazines and ammo. The soft recoiling radial delayed blowback system makes this pleasant to shoot and comes with the reliability that CMMG is known for. For more info, check out CMMG.com. Hey there, Tundra Nation, and welcome back to the channel. As an Air Force vet, I've always been interested in America's best pilots, and I've noticed they don't really get the attention that some of the other branches get around the internet. We here at the Tundra HQ, well, we've decided to fix that. And I know, we were surprised too. We're going to introduce you to a slew of American heroes that you may not know too much about. If you like the idea of this becoming a regular thing, let me know in the comments section down below. Today, we're starting with America's most successful converter of German airplanes into field sculptures, World War I ace Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. All of what you're about to hear combat-wise was accomplished, shockingly, in less than seven months. Well, that was fast. Eddie, or Ed Rickenbacker as he was known, was born in 1890 in Ohio. As a youngster, he started smoking at the age of five because why not, and joined the street gang shortly thereafter. As a teenager, he got a job working for a car company, and by 20, he'd moved up to racing for Firestone and competing in the first ever Indy 500. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, Ed wasn't a regular kid. He was also a bit superstitious as a driver. During a must-win race, he followed his Swiss mother's advice and paid a local farm boy to catch a live bat for him. Yep, a freaking bat. You know the things with wings, sonar, and are associated with the whole vampire thing? Well, Ed took this bat, cut out its still-beating heart, tied it to his middle finger with a red string, and went racing. Imagine being passed in a race by somebody flipping you the bat. That would be an exciting bookend for anybody's entire life story, but Ed was in his early 20s. Then Franz Ferdinand got sent to the Gulag and Germany third-partied the fight in what became known as World War I, or the Great War, or the War to End All Wars. That last one really didn't stick, did it, Germany? Ed, like a lot of great young Americans, was forced to go across the street to Europe and tell the neighbors to keep it down. Now, what's a young man who likes to go fast and is good with engines supposed to do? Be a pilot, right? Wrong! Because of his lack of formal education, Ed had to persuade the army that going fast and nearly dying on the ground was enough of a qualification to let him go fast and nearly die in the air. Now, is there anyone out there who wants to go fast? Anybody? I want to go fast! The army eventually relented and sent Ed to flight school, where he was a quick study. After just five and a half hours of flying with an instructor, Rickenbacker flew solo, because why the heck not? Despite his lack of college degree, Rickenbacker amazingly finished his flight training in just 17 days. Seems like his get stuff done vacation was enough to keep up with an Ivy League education, and with that, in April 1918, Ed flew his first combat flight. By the end of May, he scored six individual victories to earn himself the title of ace and the French Croix de Gras. I don't know what a Croix de Gras is, but since it's French, I'm just going to go ahead and assume it's a tasty sandwich with some stinky cheese. And that is nice considering shooting down six airplanes works up a bit of an appetite. Soon after this feat, though, Ed was grounded by a sickness. Bring out your dead. <laughs> one. No, I'm, I'm not dead. What? Now I think it's worth talking about what kind of plane Ed was flying for most of the war. The plane was called the SPAD X-13. Now the SPAD stands for something French and I'm not going to try to pronounce those words. When your country lands a robot on Mars or at least doesn't require Americans to pay for two round trips to stop the neighborhood bully from taking your capital, I will learn to pronounce French things. I'm American. Honestly, we can barely pronounce our own words correctly. We even made French food better. You gave us a croissant, we slapped some pork, egg, and American cheese on it and called it a croissant which and sold a billion of them. See, that's what America did in the 1900s. We defeated Germany and made sad European breads even better. So is that you Americans are dumb, you know nothing about Europe. It's not that we're dumb, we're just not that interested. But if you want to know what it's like to fly in a spad, take a look around your house. Find some curtains, maybe some bed sheets, clean sheets, you heathens, and now glue all of those things to some wood. Shove a lawnmower engine in it and a machine gun on it. 
shoot that machine gun, and then try to have a conversation with your wife about where you're going for your next anniversary. Congratulations, you have just built a spad simulator. A spadulator, if you will. My point is, these things were basically held together like the crap art project you made in kindergarten that your mom still pretends to love. By the way, how is your mom? Tell her I said hi. When Ed kicked whatever virus, likely Batborn, he had to the curb, he returned to his squadron, was promoted to captain, and placed in command, passing over a bunch of the Ivy League types that had looked down upon him when he tried becoming a pilot. Suck it, nerds! The very next day, Captain Ed went on to achieve the feat that would eventually earn him the highest honor of the U.S. military, the coveted Medal of Honor. Taking to the skies near a place called Billy, France, he came upon a squadron of seven German planes, including five of the new Fokkers. Given the odds, a more sensible man would avoid a seven-on-one dogfight. But Ed was sure of his abilities and the size of his giant testicles stuffed into his flight suit and decided to kick that hornet's nest. Even though Ed was breaking his own rule, because as a commander, he ordered his men to never engage in a dogfight where the odds were worse than 50-50. Ed dove down onto the enemy, shooting down two planes while the remaining German pilots suddenly realized they left the bratwurst on the stove and headed back to Germany. For the gallantry of overcoming the 7-1 odds, Rickenbacker became a legend. The secret to Ed's success sounds so simple. He'd learned that the best way to take down enemy planes was to sneak up on them. Once he determined their position, he'd come down from above and with the sun behind him. The enemy planes never even saw his fighter until it was too late, and by the time they could react, the attacking pilot was out of sight and ready for another run. Now I can already hear you guys in the comments. Oh wow, sneak up on him, what a strategy. Mm. Sure, it sounds simple today because Ed was one of the first Americans to actually spend time thinking about and developing the early doctrines of air-to-air -air combat. This is common sense today because people like Ed took the time to learn what actually worked and what didn't. By the time World War I ended, Rickenbacker flew a shocking 134 combat missions. He shot down 22 airplanes and four observation balloons for a total of 26 kills. Shooting down balloons sounds easy, but trust me, it wasn't. They didn't have F-22s with AIM-9Xs on them back then. After the war, Ed returned home, got married, bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, then bought Eastern Airlines, and because he could, started a comic strip. He lived happily ever after, right? Well, unless you count the two plane crashes he was in between February 1941 and October 1942. We'll do this next part quick. The first crash was an Eastern Airlines DC-3 that crashed near Atlanta, Georgia. He was trapped in the wreckage, and while trapped, soaked in jet fuel, which we would consider to be less than optimal. <laughs> I'm in danger. Later, it was determined he had serious injuries, including a fractured skull, a shattered elbow, and a pelvis, a paralyzed hand, broken ribs, a crushed hip socket, and a broken left knee. Seven things. Oh, let's not forget the eighth thing. His left eyeball was also blown out of its socket. In spite of his own critical wounds, Rickenbacker encouraged the other passengers and instructed the survivors who were still ambulatory to attempt to find help. The survivors were rescued after spending only one night at the crash site. This is known as the opposite of glamping. You'd think that after that, Ed would have just chilled out and traveled by train. <laughs> Not with those giant nuts he was still carrying around. America was at war once again, and old Eddie, he knows a thing or two about the disposing of sauerkraut. 18 months after the crash in Atlanta, he was requested to carry a secret message to General Douglas MacArthur from the Secretary of War. The B-17 Ed was on crashed into the ocean. For 24 days, Ed and the survivors of the crash lived on meager water rations and by killing small birds that would sometimes land on their rafts. They were rescued after being spotted from the air and Ed lost a shocking 60 pounds during the ordeal. Damn, the Grim Reaper must have gotten really tired of thinking he was there for Ed, only to be told not so politely to get wrecked. Ed was too busy being the ultimate survivor for this whole death thing to ruin his plans. 
After making Eastern Airlines the most profitable airline of its time, Ed finally retired and traveled with his wife until he passed away in 1973 at 82 years old. I can only imagine when he finally did meet the Grim Reaper, Ed told him he was dog water at his job and had a few pointers. I am dead. Yes, well, the thing is, we've got some people from America for dinner tonight. Who is it, darling? It's a Mr. Death or something. He's come about the reaping. I don't think we need any at the moment. Hello. All right, Thunder Nation, that's the quick story of Fast Eddie Rickenbacker. I'll see you guys next time when we still don't know what the heck we're doing. Bye-bye.